Hi everybody, welcome to Inspirited Live, and this week we have an exciting presentation for you called The Master's Service. Welcome everyone, let's begin with prayer. Father in heaven, we invite the presence of the Holy Spirit into our midst. Please engulf our thoughts in our words. May they bring clarity to your word, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Now, I want to just explain a little bit about uh, how you can participate in this week's study. Um, for those of you guys who are new and watching for the first time, welcome. Um, so basically, here's how you do it. Now, if you want to participate by just watching, you're probably already doing that. Um, you can use Justin TV, uh, Ustream, and what's the other one? I think, uh, oh, Make TV as well. So uh, if you're on and you're watching, you're great. And if you want to participate in, by using the text chat, you just simply type uh, a message and I'll be able to see it from right here. And most of the time you'll see me kind of looking down because I'm monitoring for your participation. Now, if you don't want to use the text chat that's directly in any one of those broadcasters, you also have the option to just send me a message on Facebook. So as you send me messages, I'll read them aloud and uh, you know uh, we'll answer your questions. Now, if you want to come in by webcam, you simply put in the link that you see above my head. And as you put in that link, you will be brought into our uh, study through Uvu, and then once you, uh, you know, once you see yourself in the webcam, then you just simply put up one finger, and we will put you full screen so that you can ask your questions or make your comments. Now, if you want to participate by phone, you just call in our telephone hotline, 712-432-3066, and then the access code, which is 426-101. Once you're in the telephone conference line, you simply press five star on the telephone keypad and then we will unmute your line so that you can participate. Okay? So if you have any other questions, feel free to send me a message. Like I said before, you'll uh, see me looking down a lot because I'm monitoring for your participation. This quarter continues uh, with revival and in, in, in reformation. And as John has indicated, tonight's subject is the master's service and we have a memory verse and I'd like us to look at that it's Acts chapter 1 and verse 8 Acts chapter 1 verse 8 <clears throat> and it goes this way but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. What did this mean to the hearers, to the people who lived at that time? What did it mean? One of the things I like to do is to set is to is to give you the setting in which this particular statement was made in Acts chapter one. And to understand it, you have to take a look at, 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 at maybe secular history. And that is, uh, just around this period of time, four decades before Jesus was born, there was Caesar, Julius Caesar. And after he died in 44 BC, a comet appeared in the sky and of course a witness came forward and said that comet was Julius Caesar ascending to the right hand of Zeus uh, the cry of course <clears throat> had been Caesar is Lord you'll remember from history that the Caesars were worshipped well along came Augustus Caesar not to be outdone, he claimed to be the son so that he could be worshipped as well. If, Ju if Julius was worshipped, then he could be worshipped because he was the son. So for that statement in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, where Jesus says, wait for the, you will receive the Holy Spirit, then you're to be witnesses of me in all Judea and to the ends of the world. What was the message that the followers of Jesus were taking? 
what I asked uh, Andrew was what message, what was the what was the weight that the disciples had given the fact that Caesar was considered the Lord and Augustus Caesar his son and now Jesus is sending his followers, his disciples to go and spread the gospel about him. What was what was the weight that they had to carry? Uh, well, the message the, was, and the weight was uh, Jesus and his salvation and his coming to us and the, his resurrection power because the fact that Jesus can give you a new creation, create a new life, and you are, at that just one thing is new, not just ten things are new, but everything about you is new. And that's a, that's a, uh, the scripture concurs with that in Second Chronicles, Second Corinthians, and it says, it says, therefore, if I is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. So Jesus is saying that he can, he can create new, new life, new life in us, and that is all his power of Christ. And it was all because of Christ, because it also says in the second chapter, Corinthians is expanding that idea. He says in 2 Corinthians 5 21, it says, For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Because it's all about Jesus, it's all about his righteousness, his life, his way, and the purity and holiness and righteousness that he has, and the, the, that fact that he imparts that to us, he gives us new life. Yes. Jesus, in effect, says that I want to send you out into the world and you'll be my witnesses. Uh, not of the ascension of some fake Caesar like God, but you'll be witnesses of my resurrection and my ascension. And you'll proclaim that Jesus is Lord. And so from the counterfeit, God seeks to tell the truth through witnesses. What is there about a witness that is preferable to simply making a proclamation? Picture this. In, in, in a real situation, when you, or as an example, I think I'd use going for employment. You're going for a job, and the th first thing they say is, I'd like uh, some references. And usually references are people who know you, correct? Whether it's professionally or personally um, or academically. And so someone, a witness is one, who can speak from personally being with you, hearing you directly, you see you hear, and you spend time with an individual. That's a witness. And that is more compelling than someone simply saying, I'm Caesar, and this is my proclamation. Are you with me? So God could have said, listen, I'm God, I'm sovereign, and you just got to believe me. But instead, God chose to use witnesses. In other words, in the service of the Master, everyone who receives the gospel is supposed to go and tell others about it. Did you get that? That when you receive the gospel, the good news about Jesus, you're supposed to go and tell others about it. There's an answer that came in before. It probably meant that they were going to be recognized as Christ's followers to the world by preaching and practical works, even healing. It may not have been understood how it may not have been understood how, since they did not speak the languages of the entire world. I like that comment. Thank you. I'm sure that uh, the disciples were uh, per perhaps thinking their task daunting. You remember in, in uh, Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 and 20, Go ye into all the world, 
make disciples, baptizing them, and then you're supposed to teach them all things as I've commanded you. And this idea of going to the whole world w w was extraordinary. I want you to understand that at the time that the disciples were giving that, the Roman Empire is estimated uh, to have been at, at, at around 50 million people. 50 to 70 million people in the Roman Empire at that time. And when Jesus told them to wait for the Holy Spirit, there were 120 people up in the room. 120 disciples, 70 million people to inform. Amazing. It had to seem impossible to the followers of Christ. But they believed in him and they did as he bid. The outpouring of the, first I want to talk about what I consider to be the burden on Christ's heart, of his heart, is simply the salvation of the human race. Paul wrote um, to Timothy that it is the Savior's desire that all be saved. In Second Peter, it says that, 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 that God... Uh, delays because he wants all to come to repentance and all to be saved. So the burden on, on the heart of the Lord, on the heart of Jesus, was that salvation would be available and effective for the entire human race. So now I'm going back to Acts chapter 2, um, the believers were told to tarry in Jerusalem. They were not to leave Jerusalem, stay in the city, until um, the Comforter come, or the Holy Spirit. And even today, there are Jews that celebrate the day of Pentecost. What was the day of Pentecost all about? In the Jewish religious system, what is the day of Pentecost about? Okay, the Feast of, of Pentecost was a memorial of the giving of the law at Sinai. Uh, Sinai was, a, was about the covenant, about commitment, about a group of people that were going to be God's representatives uh, to tell the world about who he was and his kingdom and his government. Sinai was about God's people returning to God and that they were, since they had been estranged since the Garden of Eden, God enters into this covenant relationship with them, and that's what Pentecost was about. So what happens at Pentecost in Jerusalem is like what happened in Sinai all over again. Only this time, God is not taking up residence on a mountain or in a tabernacle. This time, God is dwelling where? In people. At Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, they were to wait for the Holy Spirit. You remember the story. The disciples were amazed and overwhelmed by this new reality that everybody everywhere could understand that God is doing something new through Jesus. They, they the Jews, had been very proud of the fact that they had entered this covenant relationship with the God of heaven, and that it was they who would impart to the world uh, who God was and his message to 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 humanity and now instead of God being present in the temple and there was the Shekinah glory and the cloud the pillar of cloud and fire um, God moves on the individual 
and the Holy Spirit or God is in them rather than in the tabernacle, that physical building. Are you getting it? Um, the significance is this. There were individuals um, from all over the world present in Jerusalem. And when the Holy Spirit came, Acts chapter 2 tells us there was a sound as though it was a mighty rushing wind, and then there were these tongues of fire that sat above each person's head, and they were given the ability, the Holy Spirit filled them, and they were given the ability to speak in tongues. What did that mean? What's speaking in tongues? What is the Bible description of speaking in tongues? It occurs here in Acts chapter 2 at Pentecost. If you look up the uh, definition, it tells you that tongues is languages. Tongues is languages. And what happened there when the Holy Spirit rested on these 120 individuals? They were primarily Galileans, right? These, these disciples, these followers of, of Christ. And they were given the ability to speak in languages of all of the hearers. Uh, you know, <laughs> this is extraordinary. There were about 17 different nationalities that were mentioned by Luke in chapter 2 of the book of Acts. And how many languages were represented, uh, uh, we don't know. And John, there was a place where it says they weren't even just languages that, that these people were speaking in. They were speaking in the dialects. You know, I, uh, I, I never really understood dialects until I, I, I met people from Africa. And um, my friends would say, oh, we speak three languages. We speak Swahili, um, which is sort of like a regional language that a lot of people can understand, whether you're Kenyan or from Tanzania or from, from other parts south of there. Um, people can speak and understand Swahili. But then there's your national language. But then there's your tribal language. So there are dialects where people live in the same country and can't be understood by other of their countrymen because of the difference in the dialect that it is so unique to a, a localized mm -hmm. geographical area. And, and in the connotation here is that people, whether they were from Carthage, uh, whether they were from, from Libya, or whether they were from Greece, or whether they were from Rome, all heard in their in their own original language, including in their dialect. So suddenly what was impossible for human beings to do, like, you know, Jesus ascending into heaven tells them, you know, go and preach the gospel to every nation, every kindred, and every tongue. And these guys are scratching their heads like, well, how do we do that when, you know, we don't even speak the languages of every nation, every kindred, every tongue. And the Holy Spirit made, uh, made possible for man what, what used to be impossible. Exactly. And that's why I gave that background about the number of people in the Roman Empire at the time. And right. Jesus is saying, go to the ends of the earth. And, 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 that, and that number is a minimal number mm -hmm. because uh, th th perhaps it was more than just the Roman Empire uh, that was around in those days. And, uh, but 70 million people, 120 disciples. And it seemed impossible... But here were all of these nationalities gathered in Jerusalem at this particular time, and the Holy Spirit is poured out, and now everyone hears about Jesus from the witnesses in their own tongue. Amazing. That's amazing. Yeah. It's amazing. It really is. It is amazing. Um, and don't you think that that was much more powerful than somebody standing up an official of the government 
perhaps a presidential news conference in which was read by the Joint Chiefs or by somebody, the Chief Justice, mm -hmm. a proclamation that said, Jesus is Lord. <laughs> Instead, you had everyone hearing that he was Lord based on eyewitnesses in their own language. Amazing. And, you know, that goes back to the prophecy that, uh, that God made in the Old Testament that this is exactly what was going to happen. Uh, I think the prophecy is found in Isaiah. I'll look it up in a minute. But it says, uh, with stammering tongues and with strange lips will yes. I speak to this people. That's right. Isaiah. Um, and so it was a prophecy where in the Old Testament, Jesus told his followers that um, he would yet have mercy on them in spite of the fact that they had rebelled. And one day he would speak to them again. He would still continue to... Uh, to send ministers to them, but this time they would be in foreign languages. And this was to be to their embarrassment because of the fact that they wouldn't hear God while, they, while, while God was speaking to them through the prophets in their native language in the first place. That's right. So now he sent them prophets and uh, he sent them uh, apostles, all speaking different languages, um, to share with them the message that they should have already really known. Exactly. And, and, and the disciples were amazed. The apostles, they, 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 they weren't ready for this mm -hmm. in the sense of expectation. It, it went way beyond their expectation. It, 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 it rocked, we could say it rocked their world. And I'm going to find that text and I'll read it. Um, absolutely, please do. And there was this, God was doing something new through the people it, themselves. And here at Pentecost, the church, which is the bride of Christ, correct, uh, takes the place, takes her place, the church takes her place in the story of redemption, bringing men and women to a knowledge, a, of a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ and who he is and what he can and will do for you. I found it. Okay, this comes from Isaiah chapter 28. But, you know, what's also interesting about it is it, it's also the text that has a lot to do with how you can study and understand the Bible. And a lot of people who are new to uh, Christianity, who've never, you know, opened up a Bible before, maybe looking at it, well, how do I understand the Bible? How can I possibly understand these things mm -hmm. which are so foreign to me? And this is what the scripture says. I'm going to start at verse 9. Whom shall he teach knowledge, and whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breasts. For precept must be upon precept, Precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line. Here a little and there a little. For with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to this people, to whom he said, This is the rest wherewith ye may be sorry, wherewith ye may cause the weary to rest, and this is the refreshing, yet they would not hear. So because they wouldn't hear God, God sent them prophets and apostles that could speak in languages where they were dispersed throughout the world, so that then there was no excuse. Everybody would have a chance to hear the message of salvation. What a God we serve. Uh, yes. Someone else has a comment or a question. I'm listening. If you're in the... I'm just going to say that. I'm just going to say that. Um, with, with the wonderful words uh, that we have from Jesus, where, you know, we can... There's... There's a way that we can study it. We can we could just read it and just read it and get no blessing from it. And we could just uh, we could even we could we could have devotionals and get no blessing from it. But Jesus Christ has taught us in the Bible how to study His Word. You know, precept to God, upon precept, line upon line in Isaiah, and here a little, there a little, line upon line, here a little, there a little, and I'm from Isaiah, and also. From the book of Psalms, in Psalms chapter 1, it says, Blessed is the man who walks down in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But, it says, but, his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. So, if you, this the psalmist is meditating on the law day and night, meditating. It says meditation is something that he dreams deep of. It's something that he spend time and illuminate on. It's something that he um, ha has his mind focused on. And then in the, uh, another time in the Bible, in Joshua, it says in Joshua chapter 1, verse 8, it says, This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, you, but you shall meditate in it day and night, and, do you, and that you may observe 
do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you'll have good success. So Jesus, the Lord gives us good success and makes us prosperous. It helps us. It, it comes out of our mouth. We speak the we speak the words from God's law, and then it's just, it's our meditation day and night. And it, there are twice it says day and night, day and night in Joshua and in Psalm. So it's more than perusal. Agre- agreed. And what's interesting here, <clears throat> um, we're at Pentecost. The disciples are amazed at the at the ability to speak these different that that the believers have of, this, of, of, of speaking these languages. And what are they doing in the languages when they speak? They're calling people to the to, to and making them aware that Jesus is Lord. They're talking about his grace and his mercy. And they're talking about his ability to forgive sins. Mm -hmm. And then what happens? People say, yes, I believe. How many people on that day accepted Jesus? A whole lot. More than we see sometimes today. Well, Acts chapter 2 says there were 3,000. And it's significant because Luke gives us the number. Luke thought it was important to write down the number of people. You know, I wanted to make a point about this particular thing because, I mean, in so many churches today, um, our world is, you know, having a lot of trouble in terms of reaching people in our communities. There are people out there who are struggling with drugs, who are struggling with all kinds of things. But yet, it seems like many churches are uh, hard pressed to reach people with the with the gospel, and I think that Jesus gave us a reason why that is. It's not so much that people are harder to reach today compared to back then. The same God of uh, of back then is the same God of today. Jesus is not any less more powerful today than he was, uh, you know, thousands of years ago. But the difference is um, in what we see with Peter. You remember when the disciples first began. Uh, fishing just before they met Jesus they were catching nothing all day absolutely nothing and it wasn't because there was anything wrong with their fishing technique Correct. they were doing all the same stuff that they usually do that had worked previously to help them to catch fish but this particular time this day they were catching absolutely nothing then here comes Jesus and he's standing on the shore and he says you know cast the boat cast the, uh, the net on the side of the boat and then as soon as they listen to him and they do it, all the fish come into this net so that it's, it's really difficult for them to even lift the net and bring all those fish into the boat. So I think there's a lesson in that today for us and for the churches that if you're in Christ catching the fish, remember when Jesus said that he's going to make us fishers of men. That's correct. Right? So catching the fish or catching people isn't difficult for God. Right. But he has to get us ready. We have to go with him, not try to do things in our own strength. And a lot of the problems that we have in our lives are because we attempt to do things without God. We attempt to find success or to, um, you know, to, to make achievements without God. And then we come up barren, just like Peter did when he was trying to fish without, um, without Jesus. Indeed. But then once Jesus came on the scene, and once he went at that task with Jesus... All of a sudden, he had more than he can even handle. So imagine what it would be like for us today if God was a part of our ministries or if God was a part of our lives. The things that we attempt to do would be so much easier. The number of 3,000 was significant to Luke. And I don't know if anybody understands why, but I'm going to tell you. Somebody read Exodus chapter 32 in verse 28, Exodus 32 and verse 28. Yes, somebody has a comment, has the answer, I hope. Go right ahead. Why was the number 3,000 significant to Luke? Well, I'm still kind of uh, learning a lot about this. I wanted to just kind of um, say that I can fully agree with what uh, Eric said about the thing in regards to um, the um, like addictions that without God 
you know, we struggle. Exactly. And, mm -hmm. um, right, and I can honestly say that me being in recovery for alcoholism, um, that makes a lot of sense, and it's very true. Um, without God in my life, if I took on my own will, I mean, I, when I take my own will on, I make a mess out of things. Um, you know, without following in God's footsteps and what God's plan is for me, you know, um, I, you know, I, mean, I struggle more. Yes. So I just, uh, I, I just wanted to kind of express with that, you know, I really believe that, you know, with the fishes, you know, unless we go to God, you know, and, you know, take on our own plan in our own life, you know, we, we can really be self-destructive. That's right. I, I totally agree. Um, you know, what she said is so true. And in fact, uh, when you look at most of those programs like Alcoholics Anonymous and many of the other programs that are, help, that are used to help re rehabilitate, uh, rehabilitate people, um, one of the first things they do is they talk to you about a higher power. Now, they try to be respectful of various different religions, so they don't necessarily tell you who that higher power is. But the point is that we need something outside of ourselves. We need something that's divine in order to help us with our day-to-day -day struggles because human beings cannot solve their own problems. And it's evident in, uh, in, in you know, how we live. Uh, Jesus said that himself uh, in the story in John uh, chapter 3 with Nicodemus. Mm -hmm. You remember he said that unless you be born again, and that word again can be translated to born from above. So that the, what we need, the new birth or the newness in us has to come from above. Mm -hmm. Just as it did on the day of Pentecost here for these individuals. That the, that the spirit is divine. And it is out external of, of us as human beings. And that's what we have to rely on. Um, Jesus said the same thing in, in John chapter 4 uh, to the Samaritan woman at the well. He said, if you knew who I was, you would ask me for living water, and the water I would give you would be living water, which would begin to bubble up in you as a spring, and you would never thirst. Not something that you as a human being can do, but it is something that is external and is divine. That's right. And, you know, you brought up the point about the woman at the well. And immediately after um, Jesus talks to her, then what does she do? She goes and she witnesses. Oh, yeah. And it shows how it shows two things, how the power of witnessing builds our faith and how the, the power of somebody's personal testimony can make a difference in the life of someone else. Um, you know, one of the things that as I was looking into this this week's lesson that really stood out to me is why would God use human beings to preach the message of salvation as opposed to sending angels, as opposed to sending something or someone else to do that work? Why entrust it to us? And one of the answers that I think was brought out here is the fact that through our testimonies, we show not only the, the theory of the, the fact that this works, but we also show the fact that this is how it's changed my life. You see, you can argue with ideas, right? You can say, okay, you know, there is a God, there is not a God. You can say, you know, this is how it works. We should follow the Bible. We should not follow the Bible. All those things you can, you can argue about. But what you can't argue with is the power of a transformed life. Uh, amen. It's, that is the most powerful witness that there can be. And it has to go to mending trust that was lost. The great wrong that Lucifer did in heaven was to engender distrust in who God was. That's right. And therefore, even greater than our salvation, God must vindicate his own character. Mm -hmm. And the way that he does that with respect to human beings is to get us to trust him again. So by having witnesses... When someone can tell you, this is what God did for me. Um, I think of some of the miracles that Jesus performed in terms of, of healing. Remember the guy that was, that <laughs> I, like, I love the story where he tells him, it was the guy at Bethesda, and he said, uh, now don't tell anybody, okay? <laughs> 
That man had said he went leaping. He had never walked in his life. And he went leaping and and praising God. And he told everybody and uh, what, what Jesus had done. Uh, the Samaritan woman who, uh, when, when Jesus tells her, uh, he asks her a question. You know, he says, uh, go get your, or he gives her an instruct, go get your husband and, and come back and talk with me. And she said, well, I don't have a husband. And, and he tells her, uh, yes, you've answered correctly because you had five husbands and the person you're living with now is not your husband. And she said, well, you must be a prophet. This is definitely Messiah, a new Messiah. When, when Messiah comes, he will tell us all things. And for you to be able to sit here and tell that to me, a stranger, then you must be, maybe you're him. And she goes back and tells everybody else. And because of her testimony, the whole town came out to see this guy at the well who said these things, and they got to meet Jesus. I'm going to read Exodus 20, um, 26, 28. My question about why was the number 3,000 so significant, and why did Luke write it down? Listen to this. So the sons of Levi did as Moses instructed, and about 3,000 men of the people fell that day. Uh-oh. Here was God's covenant people. Moses delayed up on Mount Sinai. They started worshiping the golden calf. God instructs, Moses goes and instructs anyone who's on my side, on God's side, come and stand with me. And the tribe of Levi came, told them to strap on their swords and go kill people. 3,000 people were killed. The, the people who were killed were those who were unfaithful. The people who entered the church in Acts 2, 3,000, were those who believed. Disbelief and perish, belief and salvation. And there's that interesting uh, uh, facet about the significance of that number. Just as in the past, there were people who were pulled away by sin, the sin and traps. And they were even the people who were covenant keepers, were pulled away. But the power of the Holy Spirit in the lives of individuals were able to reverse that. And 3,000 people accepted Jesus and began to follow. You know, and as they went about to all these different towns and all these different places witnessing, people could see how it had transformed them as individuals and also the power that it had um, to make the impossible possible. And even in the sermon itself, uh, people listening in their tongue said, aren't these guys Galileans? How right. could, how, they've never even been out of uh, Palestine. How is it they, how, how can they know this language? That's right, yeah. How can they be speaking in my tribal dialect to me perfectly? That's mm -hmm. impossible. And that's how people believe. Because they were then eyewitnesses of a changed life. That's right. And the Holy Spirit could not inhabit an individual if that individual had sin. Uh, you know, one of the great things about God's patience and his long suffering with us, uh -huh. in spite of the fact that we make mistakes, is that God then uses those mistakes to turn that person around and then send them back to the same friends that they used to have, back to the same uh, people that saw them mess up. And he uses them to show them his power to transform. So he allows us to mess up. And then at the same time, he fixes us so that we can be able to reach those around us who are struggling with some of the same things. Uh, the most uh, powerful influence uh, for Christ is a Christ-like life. Someone whose life has been changed and no longer do they do the things that tear people down, but they lift people up. Um, one of the things about witnessing and sharing that I want to stress is that uh, Jesus talked about it in Matthew chapter 25. And he talked about sheep and goats. And he talked about the saved as sheep 
on his right hand, and the lost as goats on his left hand. And what determined, it seems, salvation or not, was not the knowledge of the law, not the memorization of all of the, the, the statutes, but whether or not a person had compassion and cared for their fellow man, whether or not they had love. I'll, I'll read that text. Uh, it was Matthew chapter 25, yes. starts at verse 34. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom that is prepared for you from the foundation of the world. So this was prepared from the very beginning. From the beginning. For I was a hungred, and ye gave me meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me in. Naked, and ye clothed me. I was sick, and ye visited me. I think there was a uh, comment coming in, right? Yes. Okay. Well, this is, this is a comment about love, and it's about Jesus, and about us, too. And it's a comment about Jesus and of us. And it says that, um, you know, love of God is love, First John 4, First John 4, 8, and First John 4, 14, I think it is. And then it, and then it's, so God is love. And then in First Corinthians 13, 4, it says, love suffers long. Love suffers long in his time. Love does not agree, does not pray to self, does not puffed up. And he goes on. But the first thing that it says there about love specifically is love suffers long. Okay. So um, going back to um, the whole witnessing, um, you know, we like you were saying in uh, Matthew 25, one of the things that Jesus looks at is how do we share right. what, what what we have with others? And, you know... Uh, there are other people who, you know, maybe they, they've run out of luck. You know, they're, they're, they're really down in the dumps and, you know, they're naked. They're, they're without food. And, you know, are we reaching out to those people? Are we taking care of them? So God, uh, part of um, the whole salvation process is not simply being saved so that you can have eternal life, but also being restored to the character and the image of God. And as the image of God, which is what man was created to be, God expects us to be like him in character. And that's one of the crucial things that answered um, what I was, what I, the question that I posed earlier today. Um, why God chose human beings to take part in this message of reconciliation. And one of the reasons is because in developing his character, we have to show love to other people just like how he loves. God is so loving that he causes the sun to rise on both the just and the unjust. The same food that feeds um, those who are uh, righteous feeds those who are wicked. So God is kind to those who are kind to him, and he's kind to those who are unthankful and, and wicked. So in being like God, um, by participating in sharing the gospel with other people, we actually are encouraging them. We actually are being like God in how he is constantly outreaching and stretching out his arm to help someone else. God um, never found an individual that he didn't love no matter what and that he was he was never too busy to help uh, i'm gonna tell a john spellman story that i think <laughs> is 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 really powerful um we know that the law says that on the sabbath we should rest and we include not making purchases on sabbath and so forth and i remember one day um we were doing some outreach on the sabbath and John met up with someone, and he tried to share Christ with this individual. And the person told him, listen, I'm hungry. I, ain't, um, I don't even want to hear it. And John took that man to the store on the Sabbath, bought him food. And the guy said, now you can tell me whatever you want to tell me about Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> and we may chuckle. But that act of compassion was, in fact, what Jesus did. Because the church leaders had been saying that to heal somebody on the Sabbath was work. And therefore, mm -hmm. couldn't be done. And Jesus brought some of his most precious miracles. I call them precious because they touched my heart. Um, that he did in healing individuals uh, who, had, who were hopeless. 
and he heals them. And, and in the physical healing, there was also something spiritual. Mm -hmm. And in the judgment, not only in, Mark tw in, in Matthew 25, but elsewhere it says that we're judged based on what we've done for others. Mm -hmm. And Jesus says that if you do it for the least, you've done it to me. That's right. And so in sharing our faith, there's nothing more compelling we can do than to witness, not to preach the law. I'm not suggesting that the law is not required. But what I'm telling you is that the application of the law will manifest itself in the way that we treat other human beings. That's right. I mean, Scripture even says love is the fulfilling of the law. And so by loving other people, by showing other people love, yeah. we actually are fulfilling all that God requires of us. Because love worketh no ill to his neighbor. And so when we go out and we share with other people where we've been and where God has brought us, you know, um, we're able to uh, show and demonstrate the character of God because that's what God does. He right. demonstrates his love to us. And by helping other people who are down in the trenches, we're actually showing God's character being developed in us. And the more we practice it, the more it builds. Before precept, God restores you or delivers you from your bondage. I like the person who said, listen, I'm a recovering alcoholic. And thinking back on some of the, way, some of the strategies that are used, and you pointed out that thing about the higher power and so forth. But most importantly, if you, if you look at the biblical record of Christ, whenever he comes in contact with an individual who everyone else, the church, the church leaders, have told them that they are sinners and despicable. Jesus does not even condemn them. He says, sin no more. Um, a question came in earlier. How do you know that these speakers of tongues, were what, what they were saying, uh, that they were claiming Jesus as Lord? Can you tell it by scripture? Please provide text. Uh, it, is clear what Peter, uh, it is clear what Peter said, but what about the others? Um, I can answer that, actually. That's, uh, that, the answer to that comes in Acts chapter 2. Mm -hmm. um, I know the text by heart, but I want to... Um, you want to read it. Yeah, I want to read it okay. just so we can um, make that clear. Someone else had a comment? Go ahead. You can make your comment while I'm uh, grabbing the text. You're on the air. I was going to continue. I was going to continue with the point about love suffers long. And so Jesus, when he was on this earth, he suffered long. But God, God says to us in, um, I think it's Second Corinthians chapter four, Second Corinthians chapter four, verse sixteen to eighteen. It says, "Therefore we do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. For our light affliction." which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. But we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. So, you know, we, we may go through trials and temptations and heartache on this planet, and we may have pain, but God is saying to us, He's reaching out to us in love, and He's saying, don't lose heart, don't lose heart, because the day is coming, when I'll come, I'll come for you, according to John 14, 1 to 3. He'll come for us, and he'll take us home to be with him. And where he'll be our God, and we'll be his people. And we, we, we will suffer on this planet, and we will have heartache, and we will have pain. But God is saying that we, we are able to, he'll remove that in the final day of judgment, when uh, Revelation 20, 21, verse 4 where he'll remove, he'll remove he'll remove the tears he'll remove the trouble he'll remove the pain and we won't and we won't suffer anymore. Thank you. Amen. Now going back Acts, to the Acts chapter two. Yeah. Um, going back to the question, it was how do you know that the speakers of tongues were what they were saying? Well, in answer to that question, as we look at Acts chapter two and particularly at verse uh, after the verses where he lists all the different languages that he yeah, hears. Verse eleven. Yeah. Right. Uh, in verse eleven, he says. Cretes and Arabians, we do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. And they were all amazed and were in, and were in doubt, uh, saying one to another, what meaneth this? 
So yeah. everybody understood what someone else was saying. They understood that these guys were um, basically uh, teaching them or, or preaching to them the wonderful works of God. Do we know the exact words of what exactly word for word they were saying? No, but we do know that they were preaching the gospel and that the people understood what exactly this meant. The only sermon that is pre was presented in Scripture was Peter's sermon, mm -hmm. uh, which was the umbrella. But think of Peter's sermon almost as a response to the scoffers who were saying, ah, these guys are drunk uh, they, because the Galileans, they can't possibly know these languages. That's right. And, 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 uh, the, but that verse 11 of chapter 2, when it talks about sharing all the wonders of God, that is where the details come in that, that, mm -hmm. that the others beside Peter were, 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 were witnessing to others about. They were witnessing of their own firsthand knowledge. Right, of, of, and of what, what what were the works of God that they were declaring? What uh, what was it that God had done? What work had he had he accomplished? Yeah, the whole process of their salvation, which makes Jesus Christ their Lord. Well, it it what's 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 ironic about it the very the very fact that they were standing there speaking in a tongue that they had heretofore had not even understood themselves, uh, and that they were speaking accurately as proven by the very people who were asking the question about. How, do, how did you get this? It was from the Lord. Okay, I think we're just about out of time. So uh, let's just share some, some closing thoughts for this week. Yeah. Uh, we talked a lot about, um, you know, uh, how powerful a person's personal testimony can be in reaching out to others. So I want to mm -hmm. encourage our viewers that, um, you know, if you have an experience with God, it's important for you to share that experience with those around you because there's a world out there that needs to know that there's a loving Savior that can make the difference and can make the changes that are needed in their everyday lives. So witnessing is a big part of, um, you know, making a difference in people's lives. But it's also a part of building our own faith because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. And so if nobody ever shares the Word of God, if it's never shared with anybody, then there's no growth in faith. And you don't know about a God that you can trust unless you test and you, and you, and you um, experience um, the fruits of that faith. I, I, I want to suggest to you that uh, f f growth in faith is very much like the story of the, of the feeding of the 5,000. There was the two loaves and f uh, two fish and five loaves and 5,000 men, not including women and children, were fed and it says that they ate as much as they need. The needed Christ just kept breaking it and it spread and the same thing is true of when we put our faith into action mm -hmm. when we as we utilize faith we're, we're given even greater faith um, as I is my belief in a particular thing of the Lord and I and I and I lay hold of it when I can't see mm -hmm. the outcome but I believe then, and then I get the blessing. Oh man, I'm ready the next time when trouble knocks. I don't even think twice about it. I don't need to stress mm -hmm. because the Lord is there. And that's why God doesn't always prove things to us. Because exactly. if he proved everything to us, then there would be no need for faith. There would be no trust. There would only but, be an academic understanding. Exactly. Yeah. And so God allows us to experience uh, the worry and you know, the uncertainty. And then through that uncertainty and through that worry, we learn to trust him uh, in ways that we couldn't have any other way. Exactly. Good night. God bless you. We thank you for, for being with us. I particularly appreciate the comments. Uh, I'm glad that you were able to get in, that you persevered uh, so that you could participate. And uh, we're going to pray. Father in heaven, we thank you uh, for those individuals that participated. For those individuals that are in the background and who did not speak but heard, we ask that the things that have been said may enrich an individual's life and that they may be thirsting for a deeper drink into that well of living water, Jesus Christ. This is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks for coming, everyone. Good night.